Oh my gosh, I'm so impressed so many of you showed up this morning. All right. So I am a designer, and yes, that is an official title that the United Nations awarded me. And trust me, I was just as surprised when I got the phone call to hear that that was actually a thing. Um, but I'm incredibly uh, excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about my recent obsession in life. And uh, does anyone have a pretty nerdy obsession, a knowledge obsession with anything? Brain science, oh good, there's like five of you. The rest of you, we'll talk later. Um, it's okay, you can find passion and purpose somewhere else in life, it's all right, we'll get there. So essentially, what I'm extremely interested in is how to make change in the world. I run a few different initiatives. Um, a design agency called Disrupt, uh, the Unschool of Disruptive Design for Adults, where we teach people how to uh, challenge the status quo. And I also design tools and resources that are based on cognitive experience design to help people, anyone in the world, challenge the way we can make the world work better for all of us. But my most recent obsession, and I've had many, just as many existential crises, I think, as well, is to figure out how to help the economy move towards circularity. The circular economy essentially is a movement away from the status quo. You see, humans are really good at creating linear systems. Essentially, our entire industrial process is based on this idea where we take raw materials out of the ground, we process them into goods and services, like your glasses or the cell phone that you will try very hard not to look at in the next three minutes, and the other things that help make our lives incredible. And then, at the end of that life, we have waste. It's inevitable. This linear system is designed to maximize productivity and obviously profit, but it has a huge issue, which is that there are many externalities that come about as a result of this system. Externalities are the unintended consequences of the things that we do. And a lot of the problems that we see in the world, social, economic, environmental, personal even, often come about as a result of this extremely myopic, one-dimensional perspective of how this beautiful big planet that we all share works. So what I'm super interested in is how to find ways of designing systems and services and products and processes that circularize that linear economy. But there's a bit of an issue, and that is that humans are humans. <laughs> we are full of these things called cognitive biases. They're brain glitches that we all share. There is not one single human on this planet that is immune to a cognitive bias. And sociologists and uh, brain scientists have found hundreds and hundreds of cognitive biases that impact us all. And why? Because our brains are very complex places. In fact, it's argued that between something like 85 to even 95% of our cognitive processing is done at the subconscious or limbic system level, the middle part of our brain. You know, the bit that we see when we look at a brain, if you are, just doing that for fun, um, is the squiggly bit. That is actually uh, the forefront of our brain. It's the most recent evolutionary part, and it's not making a lot of our decisions. Our emotions are. Our experiences are driving the things that we do. And more importantly, the cocktail of neurochemicals that influence absolutely every decision we make. I'm a little obsessed as well with the relationship between cortisol and oxytocin. Oxytocin is not Oxycontin. I just had this conversation backstage. <laughs> Cortisol is your stress hormone. It's the thing that makes you feel anxious. It's the thing that drives you to do things like run away from the lion or the spider. I'm petrified of spiders. That's because I come from a country where they all kill you. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> They're out to get you. Um, but oxytocin is the human neurochemical of love, reward, and happiness. It is, get this, the kryptonite to cortisol. In fact, they can never be at the same level. Most of the time, they're in flux. When you're stressed, you're not feeling connected, and vice versa. Oxytocin is the neurochemical you get when you're first born. It's what makes you come out of the body. That is the weirdest way I've ever said that. It brings on birth. Also, I start talking about this, and I feel like I need to stop at one point, because I could talk about all the times you get oxytocin, but maybe you should just Google that and find out for yourself. But essentially, it's extremely powerful, and in my opinion, makes the world go round. But the reason I'm telling you this is because Cognitive biases influence human decision-making, and one of the biggest issues we have right now as a species on this planet is negativity bias. And it's fed by the media and the experiences that we have in the world right now. And there is this perception that the world is completely screwed up. And in some cases, it is. But 
actually we live in one of the safest times in human history, and we have a lot of the opportunities, the technologies, the resources, the will to do better than we have today. And negativity bias is essentially where humans feel more of a cognitive weight when something bad happens than when something good. So cortisol lives in our body longer than oxytocin. Makes sense, right? Like in the past, it was really important to know that if you ate the red berry several times, you'll be sick several times. So we have this like predisposition to avoid loss. Loss hurts a lot. And so when you look at this, essentially a lot of people avoid dealing with the complex problems that we have in the world, from climate change to poverty to environmental preservation. Like these issues are overwhelming. And when you watch your Facebook feed, it is often <laughs> pretty easy to get filled with despair. But one of the other issues we face is that we have this confirmation bias. Humans seek out information that reaffirms what they already believe. So if you're already thinking things are pretty crap, pretty soon you end up in a downward spiral into, oh gosh, there's nothing I can do. The world is screwed. I might as well just develop a drinking problem. Yay, let's keep going with life. Anyway, uh, that might just be for me. Um, <laughs> so I have worked in sustainability for like a long time. <laughs> So anyway, confirmation bias is a problem. Uh, there are many of these cognitive biases that influence us, but the point that I'm trying to make is that our brains play tricks on us. They do. The reason is is because our brains are wired to build its ability to survive the world based on experiences. Every single experience we have creates a little like slide that then builds up over time, and our limbic system uh, pulls on that information as we go through life to make decisions about what we will and we won't do. Basically, our brain decides what the world is for us. It fills in the blanks. So if you do continue to think that the world is screwed, you know, it might be really hard for you to find ways of activating your agency, finding the tools and the resources that help you use your skills to contribute to a future that is different to the current that we have now. I call this problem loving, because I think one of the issues is people avoid problems, but I'm all like, problems, they're great, let's all have problems. <laughs> it's cognitive flipping. Learning how to love a problem lets you deal with the fact that things are messy, the world is complicated, and one of the biggest problems that I've spent my entire career on so far dealing with is what sustainability is, or what it means to be green. Let me ask you all here, yell out a word that comes to mind when I say sustainability, just do it. Recycling. She's the only one who spoke. <laughs> is it because we're in Sweden? Can I have some words, people? No meat? Yeah, I'm vegetarian, sorry. What did you say? Future. The future, oh, you're good. The rest of you, thanks. <laughs> nice participation. <laughs> Usually what happens when people have a vocal cord that they can find in the morning, it is something to do with green, eco, d d biodegradable, all of these kinds of terms that get um, used in marketing and communication and essentially are triggering our responses neurologically and they make us feel good if we buy it. Um, unfortunately, these words just describe an environmental property of a material rather than environmental benefit. And this is a really big issue because we're kind of confused about how to make good decisions. And sustainability as a concept has been quite, um, what's the word, <laughs> watered down or degenerated. But at the end of the day, sustainability is basically a pathway to figuring out how to live on this planet in a way that is not destroying the systems that sustain us. Because believe it or not, no matter who you are, we all need food, air, and water to survive. And there isn't one human, no matter what you do, even those with like, access to like, NASA spacesuits, who can survive more than like six, well, actually, there's some guys who can do 22 minutes without breathing. I was just about to say a minute, but then I watched a video on YouTube recently about a guy who could do 22 minutes, which I thought was crazy. Anyway, point being is most of us in the room can't <laughs> go without breathing oxygen, clean oxygen, for about a minute. Uh, you can try it later at home. But um, <laughs> so we have this idea that sustainability is something out there, it's some big monolithic problem. Essentially, it's about figuring out how to live within the planet's resources. Um, so let me ask you a question, and let's try this again. Let's hope this can be some participation. Do you think that a paper cup is good for the planet? No. Oh, so you're all using them every day whilst you've been here, right? Who brought their own? 
oh, can we have a group hug later? <laughs> Two favorite women in the house. Okay, so good. Well, we'll just move right along then. I don't need to talk about that. So, <laughs> but just in case you didn't say no, basically paper, paper cups are unrecyclable because they're lined with plastic, although in this country you burn everything to create fuel that displaces, displaces the use of fossil fuels, so one could argue it's better, but one could also argue it's not because you're losing those valuable materials that could have been used for something else. You get what I'm saying, right? Should I keep going? <laughs> I'll move on. So basically, sustainability is essentially about looking at the limits, constraints, and resources, rather than the, the actual product itself. It's like, how do we do things in the economy so that we can overcome or leapfrog some of the issues that disposability ultimately presents? Um, in the work that I've done for a long time now in helping industry, individuals, governments move towards sustainability and the circular economy, I've discovered that one of the issues or the byproducts of this linear thinking is that we have this one-dimensional perspective of the world, when really we need a three-dimensional perspective because this thing is round and it's complicated. And we need to have that divergency and that flexibility to be able to find ways of solving some of the complex problems because I don't know if you guys took a moment to think about this lady, but this shit is freaking awesome. This planet is like magic. Really, did you see the tree out there? The big one that has the like, how did that happen? Maybe a man with a thing, <laughs> but like, <laughs> I was pretty excited when I saw that. And it's not only that, right? I'm a really big fan of the, uh, the, the, the famous Buckminster Fuller, if you don't know who he is, you should Google him, who says he was a famous designer, design scientist, who really pushed the boundaries of the role that design has in the world. And uh, he said that there's nothing in a caterpillar that tells you it will be a butterfly. And to me, every time I think that there's something bad, or I meet someone who annoys me, um, that there's potential in everything. And that's really one of the most magical things about this planet. And uh, no matter how many uh, uh, man hours or women hours of scientific exploration do we do, do we find another planet that has the magic of this one? And even if we went to move to Mars, how do you think we'd breathe there? We'd have to take the trees and everything else. So we have this like, incredible, beautiful bounty on this planet, yet somehow we managed to really screw it up. <laughs> and so I'm very interested in how we can find ways as individuals um, to help overcome some of these legacy issues of dealing with sustainability. And the way we do that is to think in systems. So in order to change anything, we have to understand what makes the system work. In systems thinking, we like to talk about the difference between being able to think at the macro, tiny little level, the granulation of the subatomic particles of how anything works, up to the infinite, impos uh, impossibility, the infinite possibility of space. And this is a three-dimensional thinking, to be able to move between the overwhelmingness and the tiny. And in systems thinking, what we do is we learn to develop a way of seeing every problem as an opportunity and to work within the complexity of the world around us. Do we have any people in the, in the house who are really into systems thinking? No group hugs later? Oh, yeah. There's like four at the, oh, just in the middle here. So essentially, the, the basis of systems thinking is that everything is interconnected. And if anyone has done science or engineering, you will know that this is basically how everything works. Like if you want to make a phone work, you need to charge it to, through an electricity system. And uh, the reason we can breathe is because we have bodies filled with beautiful complex systems that are all interconnected. Everything in this world is interconnected in some way. Donnell Meadows was a really fantastic systems thinker who advanced the concept of using it to solve complex environmental problems. And systems are everywhere. Every single second of our day, we encounter a system. And when we're designing or we're developing a business project, we are ultimately influencing other systems. There are three main systems at play in the world, OK? So there's the social systems. Uh, you, me, and everybody else are engaging with these non-like tangible systems, like our family relationships, uh, the education system, how we, got, how we have language even. These are all social constructs. Humans somehow figured out how to make society work by developing social systems. And then we have the industrial systems, that linear process of extracting resources and creating goods that help our lives. But both of these systems are dynamically reliant on the ecosystem. 
Do you know what I mean? Like without the 50 or 60 different minerals and metals that came out of the ground to make your cell phone, it wouldn't exist. And all of those things come from the planet. Although I did read recently that we're thinking about mining space. <sighs> Don't have an opinion on that yet. <laughs> So ultimately, these things are all interconnected, and we must understand, if we want to make change in a system, how our decisions impact somewhere else. And circularity is really about that. It's about understanding the complexity of a three-dimensional world. It sounds complicated, but super easy. We use tools like systems mapping, where you can rapidly and analogally, which is not a word, <laughs> uh, understand how the complex relationships between systems work. And we really look for the unobvious parts, because in systems thinking, we also talk about how the majority of the world's view of a phenomena is from the top of the iceberg. I call this the uh, surface over substance problem, where people only look at the top. That's that whole, like, let's make it biodegradable and we'll solve the world's problems, thinking, rather than really exploring the deep-seated elements of what makes up a system. How is it that some phenomena exists? What, what is the alternative to that? Another awesome systems thinker, Peter Senge, who I'm a fan of, says that today's problems are often yesterday's solutions. So personally, I always think, I don't want to design a solution today <laughs> that's tomorrow's problems. And so in order to do that, we need to think about the consequences of our actions. And that's where developing these different mental tools, like thinking in these divergent, three-dimensional ways, and employing systems thinking, and developing a practice of thinking in circularity, because we can't solve problems with the same thinking that got us there. We know this to be true. And problems, like I said at the beginning, are really actually opportunities in disguise. If we learn to love a problem, then we have the opportunity to figure out how to solve it. And one of the best teachers for that is nature. Turns out nature already figured out the circularity thing a little while ago, because everything in nature is feeding into something else. There's no waste in nature. And I really hate to break this to you, people always hate it when I mention this, but recycling, it's actually a validator of waste. So recycling is a very limited solution to a very complex problem. One of the biggest issues we face from an environmental and social perspective is the normalization of disposability. Everybody just thinks it's okay to waste resources because it's convenient. <laughs> And it's a little bit difficult, difficult to, can I love how many words I've made up this morning? I should have had a little bit more caffeine. <laughs> so ultimately, we need to move beyond this idea that just designing at the end of life will solve the problem. Of course, recycling is extremely useful, but um, you always need virgin materials, and you need to think about how it is that um, recycling ultimately <laughs> ends up creating more and more waste, right, where we have uh, an increased uh, efficiency in recapture in a community, we often see an increased use of raw materials. So if you think about that exponentially, we're always going to see more and more waste. So that leads me to the question of, like, how do we use design and creativity as a tool to help solve these problems? And I'm going to give you an example. So, 8% of the world's carbon emissions are contributed to by food waste, according to the United Nations. So. A big amount of our CO2 is food waste. In the US alone, it's like $165 billion. In fact, the UN says it could be up to half of all fresh food produced is wasted. And that obviously has big impacts on the planet. What do you think is the biggest contributor to food waste? What do you think? Supermarkets, so the aesthetic standards that supermarkets impose. Any other ideas? Expiry dates, totally. Yeah, because people, although, come on, we all do sniff the yogurt and milk first, right? Hopefully. <laughs> Any other suggestions? Being too much at the same time. Yes, that's true, being picky, buying too much. Also, there were some recent studies that showed that our desire to show love to our family members, when we know people are coming over, we stock our fridges, we make a lot of food to feed them. <laughs> Think of any holiday occasion. Okay, none of you said my favorite culprit, uh, it's the refrigerator. Because a refrigerator is designed to do what? Prevent these things from happening? Right? What, why do you have a fridge in your house? To prefer, preserve things, to stop things from spoiling, right? It's a cold space. We used to make, make holes under our houses and keep, you know, root vegetables down there because it was the right temperature. Now we just have these white, shiny boxes in our houses, um, which was... Uh, 
ask me later to tell you the history of how refrigerators came to be. <laughs> That's a whole other story, but not my point. My point is, is that there's one part of the refrigerator called a crisper drawer that should be called the soggy drawer because anything you put in there eventually ends up soggy, right? <laughs> in the UK a few years ago, there was actually a report called the soggy lettuce report. Seriously, it was one of the most wasted food uh, household items because refrigerators do not do their job. Also, things get stuck at the back from like 1999 because you can't get in there anymore because they're so big. So if you want to think about how we can dramatically reduce, immediately reduce the environmental load that food waste has on the planet, we can redesign refrigerators tomorrow. So if you're in the refrigeration business, I'm looking at you. <laughs> now, just to get extremely nerdy for one second, because I think it's very important to explain the science behind why food waste is such a problem. Essentially, when you have something organic, natural, like say a tree or an apple, and it goes, falls on the ground in nature, it naturally biodegrades, meaning its cells start to mix with oxygen, and its components start to like, just you know, do its thing. You know, get a bit rotten, have some maggots in there, mm, yeah. Anyway, point being, it's all pretty natural. The carbon stored as the plant matter grew in its life is now just naturally re-released into the atmosphere. It's called carbon neutrality. However, when we go to put something organic in landfill, or in your case, you don't do that, you uh, put it in a big incinerator, is that right? Um, in most cases, organic waste goes to landfill. And what happens is uh, that same process is now in an anaerobic environment, meaning there's no oxygen, because it's like all the stuff's like tightly compacted and put in a big hole in the ground, ironically, usually a hole that used to be a mine site. So, and we, um, we have this process where the same organic material turns into methane, and methane is a 25 times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So your apple that you should have eaten, but you didn't because it was furry, because we all know that's terrible, and you threw in the trash and somehow it ended up in landfill, instead of it, it A, replenishing your body if you had eaten it, um, but B, it ends up basically contributing what I call a double negative. We've lost the apple from the system, you have to go eat something else, and then also we've contributed the carbon emissions in this exasper... Ex <laughs> that word, e not gonna try, um, <laughs> increased way. So ultimately, this is one of the problems. So if we can redesign refrigerators that haven't changed since the 1950s, we could dramatically reduce the carbon emissions um, that are attributed to food waste. And also think about the behavior and what the purpose of this product is in the home. So the thing is, is that if you really understand a problem, it holds its own solution. And if you think about the dynamics and the, uh, the unobvious parts of a problem set, using systems, you can start to think about ways that we can quickly circularize. And I want to take this moment to challenge you all to take 75 seconds, yes, 75, exactly, to talk to a stranger, hopefully you were nice enough to sit next to a stranger, about what it is that is one of your biggest problems in embracing circularity or sustainability, thinking about your job, your personal life, like what is a problem that you can identify, and then I'm randomly going to pick a few people to share it, okay? Let's go. Talk to the person next to you. Turn to someone, find a human. I see you not talking. I see you not talking. Talk to her, talk to her. <laughs> you too, you too, talk. <laughs> you go like, I haven't got a problem. I'm coming for you. <laughs> She's like, where did she come from? She's speaking Danish. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> this, make a threesome. Yeah, this lovely lady needs some uh, conversation. doesn't exclude you two. <laughs> All right.
right, your 75 seconds is up. Who wants to share their problem? Volunteers before I start pointing. Okay, there's like, oh, lovely sir, please tell me your problem. <laughs> Okay, so. So efficiency gain. So your biggest problem in becoming circular is not being able to measure the impact. So that's about feedback loops, knowing what it is that you're doing and getting some sort of reward. And what kind of neurochemical would that be? Oxytocin. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, do something good and get a hug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I saved some environmental impact here by bringing my reusable cups. Someone hugged me. Actually, we should make cups that say that. <laughs> and so you're talking about individual efficiency gains and feeling like an individual efficiency gain doesn't fit the magnitude of the problem. And this is actually one of the biggest issues with inertia that individuals have. I like to talk about this concept of a sphere of agency. The, and I do this because it's like, when you're little, you have no power, right? Your parents tell you, well, actually, you can scream, that's about it. And as you get older and you get knowledge and you get experience, you grow a sphere of influence. You know, your friends listen to you, the things you do, the things you wear, the things you say, has power over the people around you. And then sometimes you end up on stages with crazy awards from the United Nations that people really listen to you, which is a strange thing to happen in life. But your sphere of influence grows as you grow. And a lot of that comes through your attempts to try and... Um, to do better or to understand more. And I have to say that, like, yeah, micro actions do feel insignificant to the macro problem. However, right, <laughs> in order to change a system, you have to set a new, a new set of uh, pathways to a different outcome. I always say the future is undefined. It is made up of the individual actions that we take today. So ultimately, any problem that was discussed in that 75 seconds isn't necessarily, like, um, fixable by some like quick comments, right? It takes time to solve a problem. But the more you understand what it is that is limiting your ability to think differently, to engage with the tools and resources, to challenge those ideas that one person can't make a difference, that my acts are insignificant, because the things that you do that are unsustainable are having a bigger impact than the changes that you could make to be slightly more sustainable, if you know what I mean. So ultimately, we have to shift our perspective about these problems. I recently met an astronaut. Um, I got a little bit creepy and just kept stroking his arm for a little bit. And then after that, <laughs> I was like, tell me what it's like to be in space, because what else do you ask astronauts, right? Um, if you have a better question to ask, you can tell me later. And he was like, well, obviously, it's amazing. And I was like, OK, yeah, but more. Um, he said that like every night, he would look out his little like porthole, I don't know what they're called, but round window from the space station. And he would see Earth, and he would say goodnight to Earth. <laughs> I thought I was weird. <laughs> um, because everyone he loved lived on that round thing in front of him, his family and friends. And he, uh, he would do that every night. And then after his uh, second mission, he was coming back to Earth in their like, space shuttle thingy. I don't know what they're called either, the, the ones that come back to Earth. Um, and he said that he, he landed with his like, porthole face down, and he landed on a, 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 a blade of grass a rock and a flower. And I'm like, well, that flower? Probably not anymore. Um, <laughs> but he said the first thing he thought was, oh my gosh, thank God I'm home, right? Here's nature, here's life in front of me. But home was Turkmenistan, and he was a, an American astronaut that went up with the Russians. And it was in that moment that he realized that home was the entire planet, and that it was his job to help give people who don't get to go to space the orbital perspective, and this guy, um, Ron Garan, you can look him up, he's awesome. Um, essentially, is that like when you get to see the absolute fragility and beauty of this shared planet, then it changes your ability to see how insignificant <laughs> individual acts are versus this collective opportunity that we have to challenge the status quo. And for me personally, like, I like to think about it as the opportunity to iter iterate at the edges and innovate, and I always get like shit for this because people are like, innovation is not a dirty word, and disruption is overused. I'm like, yeah, 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 cool. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make, again, Dr. Fuller, he said that if you want to change a system, uh, you have to design a new system that makes the old one obsolete, right? So we don't get to the design outcome, right, unless we do what? We iterate, we prototype, 
And so we have to have many people challenging the status quo in different ways to figure out how to get to what the future is, the better point of humanity on this Earth. Because I'm really, really, really hoping we stick here <laughs> and not try to move to Mars, because I really like planet Earth. It's cool, it's got butterflies and trees, weird trees. So um, I'm going to give you some uh, hints in the last few minutes I have. Um, one thing I did uh, and we teach at the UnSchool is this the disruptive design method. It's a three-part process of mining, landscaping, and building. In the mining phase, we explore problems. In the landscaping, we use systems thinking to understand the nuances of the problem. And in the building phase, we basically start to build interventions through design to and then iteratively try to solve those problems. Like, obviously, one person can't always solve a problem. But uh, we can certainly try to understand it and develop the energy and capacity to challenge the components that maintain the problem. And when we're looking at circularity and moving from this linear system to a circular system, ultimately it does require us to start challenging the dominant ideas such as disposability and it being normalized. And what we really, really, really need are people who are willing to pioneer systems change. The, the companies, the individuals, the governments. We have like, I think it's like, like six com uh, countries now who have banned like some form of disposable item, like France have banned uh, packaging for food. Um, there are countries that obviously, what is it, who was it that just charged um, a lot of money if you get caught bringing a plastic bag into the country? Kenya. Kenya. Go Kenya. Let's all be like Kenya. You get to go to prison. <laughs> My TED Talk's on bags, <laughs> on plastic bags being better than paper. It, it's confusing. But uh, hopefully I'll not end up in prison in Kenya. Um, but ultimately the point is, is that the systems are complicated and we need to think about complexity as a design inspiration of how to solve problems rather than avoid them and develop a sphere of influence that enables us to keep figuring out how to engage with chaos and complexity. Um, my colleagues and I like to develop tools that help people. We developed a toolkit for everyday superpowers, like the superpower of getting shit done, um, the superpower of being wrong, best superpower. I think everyone could give that to our parents and be like, just read this. Um, we also developed some tools around circularity. You can get an introductory guide and advanced thinking in circular systems. But if you just want to start like right now, because you're like, now she's making me feel bad, um, you can just check out one of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which were released a couple years ago. And they're basically like, hey, everyone, let's figure out how to make the world an equitable and more sustainable and regenerative place. There are 17. They have subsections. Pick one that your heart resonates with and just start exploring it. Like, what makes up the problems and how can you participate in changing it? And ultimately, what we need to get to, if we want to embrace circularity as a future economy, is we need to move beyond disposability. It's extremely important that we find ways of minimizing the wastefulness that humans have somehow <laughs> decided is normal. Because when we waste materials, we also validate waste as a concept. We waste our time, we waste many things that are intangible and beautiful. And as I said, the future is undefined, and each and every one of us has the opportunity to contribute to a future that works better for all of us, and I want to thank you so much for having me today. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Leila. My pleasure, my Amazing. pleasure. We have time for questions. We have plenty of time, in fact, for questions. I have questions, but I'm thinking you might also have questions now that you've uh, uh, or problems, we can just do some more problem workshopping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, the ConfQA uh, is the hashtag for the questions. And uh, I'm going to start uh, with a few of my own. So, this idea of the normalization of disposability uh, is like much that you said. When you say it, it sounds so obvious. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, yeah, no, I agree with that. How cool. And then it's like, wait, but that's not how I live at all. Uh, so that's a little uh, challenge of like, why are these obvious things so far away from like our actual practice? Well, from a cognitive perspective, the human brain actually has to eliminate a lot of what it engages with because it's too complicated, right? Like the amount of information coming into our brains in every single second of every single day. So the last night when you were ordering a drink, I'm pretty sure most of you, except for maybe someone who works with me, wouldn't ask to not have a straw in their drink, right? Straws are pretty pointless things. I have lips. I'm pretty sure I can drink normally. But we have this huge ocean plastic problem, and a large percentage of what end up stuck in animals or on beaches are these microplastics or small plastics that have literally a lifespan of, like, a minute 
or two. It depends how long you drink. It takes for you to drink. Also, now that you're saying this, that's often gendered because typically they're only going to give... They totally give girls straws. What's up with that? Well, the reason is that girls wear lipstick and the idea is that you don't want to Do mess up your lipstick. girls wear lipstick? They think that all <laughs> girls wear lipstick. I know. Uh, but even girls who do wear lipstick know that lipstick technology has significantly advanced and this is no longer like a massive problem. So, so yes, straws, we could get rid of those. But there's such simple things like this that what you're explaining is this co weird cultural phenomenon where there's an expectation imposed upon you and then you don't have a choice and somehow your, your actions, just a little bit of alcohol to ease your life, has created a problem, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> She's like, yeah. I, I hear you, I hear you. So actually, one of my other drink. champions of the earth, um, Afros, has done the world's biggest beach cleanup uh, on Varanasi Beach in, in Mumbai. Um, it was one of the most polluted beaches on the planet. And uh, he spends every single week mobilizing a huge number of volunteers to single-handedly clean up a beach. And when we won this award, we were in Cancun, and he took me on a beach cleanup, right? 6 a.m., go out into this beach. And I'm like, I don't see any plastic. I see seaweed, and that's about it. And he's like, no, come on, let's go. And I start, like you know, going through the seaweed, and it's like um, a plethora of coloured bits of plastic, little lids from, from Coke bottles and um, half-eaten, um, like, uh, forks with their little prongs, and it's incredible. Like, you just start finding all these tiny pieces, and we got, in like an hour, like eight of these giant trash bags full of these tiny pieces of plastic. And this to me was extremely crazy because I'm like, I think I know about this stuff, mm -hmm. but it, was it wasn't even obvious to me where the problem was. And I think that that's something that we need to challenge ourselves and also experience. The moment I experienced that, it totally changed my perspective. So that's one answer to my next question, which is like, <clears throat> how do we go about under-normalizing it? So making it tangible <laughs> is one thing. You look like you want to cry, so that's not great. So no, 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 I just think it's so funny that you're also making up funny words. <laughs> <laughs> the curse of the non-native speaker. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Unnormalizing. How do we unnormalize How are we disposability? How do we, how do we, uh, verfremdung it? I don't know. The, the, so the obvious choice, like the traditional way to approach it is to shame people. Oh, that like, doesn't work. Yeah, cause, Humans, because you use cortisol and uh, negative emotions yeah. at, whilst it lasts longer, makes you feel bad and then you avoid it. Right? So most people avoid things that make them feel bad. And actually there's a lot of uh, research that shows that the negative framing associated with climate change has actually created a bigger problem for us because people avoid it. And uh, it's very easy to avoid things that are intangible and feel overwhelming, um, like the family member that you don't speak to because they annoy you a lot. It's, it's easier to avoid a lot of the time than confront uh, the problem, and that's really what the legacy of the last 20 years of environmental messaging has done. At the same time, uh, it, it's also like a relevant fact to put out there that we are talking with like a civilization ending level threat. Uh, possibly, uh, possibly like the threat of ending all life. But you're saying I think that we every, shouldn't like, say that, even no, though it's because true. I don't know if it's true. We don't know it's true. That's a hypothesis. And humanity has shown, because we've gotten pretty far today, I've got to admit, we've gotten through some really big things like plagues and shit. And we've somehow figured out how to solve every single problem that is presented to us by limitations that humans have with nature. And I think that the next stage is for us to change the way we perceive nature as, as, a, as a thing that is just there available to us in abundance that we can destroy at our own will to something that we have to work within. Mm -hmm. And that is actually the biggest educator for us because we come from nature. Our bodies are made up of the same things as a tree and an apple. And so ultimately it's our responsibility as a species with the intelligence that we have not to create bloody robots who are gonna like make my life boring when I go to the supermarket. Whoever wanted to be their own checkout person? I don't want to do it myself. I like the human who's grumpy in front of me. At least they're a human. And they're not like, did you bring your own bag? You know, I think that it's really important that we use our capacity of where we're at today to actually really think about what it means to be human at this point in time and how we can solve some of these problems. So I don't think the dystopian future is a reality. I have the full faith that we will solve that our problems. That is wonderful to hear. <laughs> and they do too. Yes. I like you all. So, but, but how to make it tangible, how to make it not, not normal, is without shaming and without like scaring people. Okay, the biggest opportunity right now is to figure out how to solve the problems that are in front of us. The reality is, is that if you say something is a, an intractable problem, it's, we used to say wicked problems, I think it's a stupid thing to say because um, I like to say messy problems because you can fix a messy problem by cleaning it up, yeah. right? And ultimately a lot of the issues that we face are messy, they're complicated mm -hmm. and uh, they're nuanced. So I don't think that it's just about, you know, 
shaming or making people feel bad. In fact, I don't think it works at all. I think yeah. what we need to do is we need to say sustainability is an opportunity for changing the way we do things so that the future works better. If we get sustainability right, then we can move to regeneration, meaning that humans actually regenerate the planet based on the things we do, which would be fucking awesome. That would be <laughs> awesome. Uh, we don't mind. Okay, because Sorry, we learn internet. <laughs> we learn English off television, so that's how we all speak. Okay, uh, Julia would like to know, individual waste versus industrial waste, food waste versus building and mining waste, how do you influence industrial things on the, the industrial level when you are not a corporation? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, scales, again, that idea of the, you know, the, uh, the different perspectives of the scopes of how the world works. I mean, eventually, if you work very hard at it, I'm sure that you would be able to influence industrial systems if you got like a lot of expertise in how that happened, okay? And then also you can campaign and different things. But I think when we think about waste, we have to also think about the fact that um, producers respond to market demands, okay? And so market, whatever you spend your money on as an individual collectively influences the things that are available to us in the marketplace. So the more technology we buy, the more technology that's available. And uh, when we stop buying CDs, they stop making CDs. And so ultimately, we have consumer preferencing power as individuals that help to influence the types of products and services that end up on the market, um, which ultimately influences the waste streams, right? Because it's all interconnected. So I would say either track one, become an absolute expert, work with industry, track two, figure out how to mobilize consumer action to change the uh, industry that you are particularly annoyed by. I would add to that that Saskia Sassen was talking yesterday about like global finance and that whole level. And there are some interesting systems questions to ask about, well, who owns this corporation? I mean, at some level, there are some humans somewhere making decisions as well. And of course, it, it is hypothetically possible to, to reach these humans. I guess like in desperation, you could buy stock to get access to meetings or something like that, but that's not available to most of us, I guess. Um, but but there, like somewhere, the, somewhere even these faceless entities have some humans working for them. Yeah, and I'm privileged enough to work with a lot of CEOs from some of the world's biggest companies, and they are humans, and they're actually usually quite nice. Always really buff, though. I'm like, how do you have so much time to go to the gym when you're also running a multinational company? It's weird. Rich anyway, people don't have all the same problems as we do. Like, they, no. don't, they don't do... People the, cook for them. Yeah, I promise, <laughs> they don't do their own grocery shopping. So. Yeah. <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to make is that, yeah, they care. They have kids. They have family. They care. It's just, unfortunately, they have to respond to their shareholders a lot of the time. And so their hands are tied to the industry that they're getting. But there are so many pioneering CEOs out there, it's incredibly exciting. How many CEOs are willing to change their business models, are willing to start to look at the circularity? The big part of the circular systems model is what's called a product service system. It's extremely nerdy, but basically you move from a linear product where you're just buying this phone, but technically you're actually buying the service of a phone call, right? Functionality defines impacts from a life cycle assessment perspective, which is a really nerdy science thing that you can do if you get really into this, but ultimately, what we decide is that how do we figure out how to provide that service that you want, the same level of technological functionality, but in a way that means that the product is designed to fit within a closed loop system. So yes. you actually just lease the service, the product is designed to be fully recycled, so you maximize the components that haven't failed just because you, know, you need the latest version. Yeah. But right now, that company doesn't do that, uh, no. which is why I don't buy that product. That <laughs> is a good choice. Uh, Bex would like to know, how do I make my friends and people around me make better choices? They are quite open about how they don't care. <laughs> Shit, five better friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I heard someone say the other day, nature, it's not for me. And I was like, well, you should stop breathing then. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I think, look, ultimately people who say they don't care about this stuff is because they're scared of what it means to care. And one of the legacies of the environmental movement has been that environmentalism has been framed in a very linear, like, micropic way. And that you have to care about, like, extremely uh, particular things in order to care about the planet. And so for me, the normalization of change needs to happen where we're like, have to acknowledge the fact that we're all humans, that we all need the planet to survive. And that that is a total bipartisan, non-religious, non-ideological fact. <laughs> and even climate science deniers can't deny that because they would die if they stopped breathing. So ultimately, I think that your friends who say they don't care, maybe you should think about talking to them about the things that they do care about and find ways of relating that to the beauty of the planet. Similarly, there's a connected question also from Bex, which is about guilt, like that, that just existing, and especially, I guess, existing within these systems, we are contributing to so much like 
horrible. Yeah, and the problem is, is killing yourself doesn't work either because then you like contribute carbon as your body degrades. It's really, <laughs> really complicated. <laughs> So, I love that there's one person with dark humor who just laughed really yeah. loudly at that. No, I think like guilt, oh look, first of all, guilt is part of the complex emotional set that humans need in order to, to survive, right? Like we need to feel pain in order to learn not to do something that wasn't helpful again. And so we are very complex emotional beings and guilt is extremely annoying because it makes you have that like ugh, pain in your stomach and then often makes you avoid things and sometimes makes you drink a lot of whiskey. But... <laughs> Guilt is also something to acknowledge. Like, why do I feel guilty about this? Because I haven't figured out how to solve the problem. Well, if I see this problem as a problem and not an opportunity, then I'm going to probably keep that cycle. But if I, in systems thinking or in cognitive sciences, we talk about um, cognitive interventions, and I like to refer to it as flipping the script. I have many 90s hip-hop references. You can ask me later. <laughs> um, but flipping the script is where you force your brain to cognitively flip to the alternative narrative that it's given you. Like, oh, the world's screwed. And what if you just spend it? microsecond thinking, actually, it's not, and find one reason why. I know it sounds really stupid, but cognitive scientists have found that that positive uh, flip actually gives you a multi-dimensional perspective of the problem. And it starts to develop this more nuanced view of the issue rather than this very myopic and linear one. Mm. <laughs> I was thinking here about um, this idea, we were actually talking yesterday morning about, about the, like, the history of the labor movement and this idea of fighting for the eight-hour work, work day and having eight hours for what, what we will. And most of the people who were fighting that fight did not have an eight-hour work day and they did not have a five-day five work week. They had no free time at all. But Just yet, like an entrepreneur today. <laughs> true that. Uh, but these people like, fought, fought and died to give us, to give us that right. As women fought and died so that I could stand here in front of you today. And thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, but the thing is, the weirdly, like they didn't have time to educate themselves on the issue. But weirdly, they came home after their 14-hour workday and went to like a study group and educated themselves because education wasn't public education wasn't available to a lot of these people. So I don't think, like I think we maybe don't have the excuses that it's all too complicated and we don't have time. And I love this what you said about the sustainable de development goals. And immediately at the same time when you said, oh, you can read on about this, I felt like, oh, but the internet is so large. There is so much information on these topics. Like that's why I created. <sighs> A school for people like you. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, you. the unschool is literally for people who wake up in the morning. They're like, oh, I have this like dissonance between like caring about the planet and my job, <laughs> and the things that I thought that I could do and what I'm actually doing. And the reality is, is that um, with this fear of influence and agency and activating our capacity to deal with other people, the people who don't agree with us, or the bosses that basically tell you to create the crap to sell to idiots that don't need it in the world. Uh, we need to find ways of intervening in that and having the tool set to do that and systems thinking and um, different sustainability sciences and creative intervention ideology helps us develop a mental tool set that does that. And I completely agree. Like, I spent the first part of my career being equally guilt-ridden and confused and, yes, developed a mild gin drinking problem. Um, but that basically was what my entire university degree told me, right, that the world is screwed that humans are screwed, that the planet's screwed. That was what I heard for four years, and that was not helpful. So I decided to develop a what I call a solutions um, uh, approach, philosophy, where if there's a big pie, there's one slither that I can figure out how to solve, right? There's a red lamp blinking here, so I'm realizing <laughs> I've gotten completely caught up in this conversation. And we have to end here, ladies, gentlemen, we all should friends, let them go. Leila Ajarolo. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.